This is Jonathan Ferguson, the Keeper of Firearms and Artillery at the Royal Armouries Museum in the UK, which houses a collection of thousands of iconic weapons from throughout history. And on today's episode, we're taking a journey down memory lane to check out some of Jonathan's favourite weapons from 2022. This is the, the Milcor M32 grenade launcher. This looks to be very well modelled indeed, including what looks to be all the functionality that you'd expect. Oh, that's superb. To put, put the two two broom handles together, insert the clips, and then smack them into each other to load it. That's borderline genius, is what that is. Jonathan and the whole team here at GameSpot just want to say thank you for everyone who's watched the show over the last year. We really appreciate your support. And if you enjoy this kind of content, make sure to keep an eye out for our new series, Loadout, a show where we take a look at the history and impact of some of the most iconic weapons in gaming, from the AK-47 and flamethrower to the SCAR and STG-44. Jonathan will be making plenty of appearances over on that show too, so make sure to check it out. Right, let's take a look at some of Jonathan's highlights from the past year. It's my old friend, the so-called broom handle Mauser, the C96. We have one here. In its holster slash buttstock that you've seen before, this is of the right sort of generation. It matches a really quite a close match for the one on screen. Doesn't, the hammer isn't quite right for this model, for this commercial model of the C96, but it's really very good. Otherwise, all the necessary contours and cut out panels and things are there. I'd have to be incredibly nitpicky to spot anything wrong with that. So they've done a good job. Oh, that's superb. Yeah, we, we often scratch our heads at uh, how how games fudge reloads where it's usually, usually for, it's for dual wielding. So usually off camera or kind of like fudged. To put, put the two two broom handles together, insert the clips, and then smack them into each other to load it. That's borderline genius, is what that is. And I'm not gonna do it, but I actually think it would work. Ready? Three, two, one, and send it. <laughs> and keep shelling, don't stop. Wow, that was that was seriously impressive. I saw the the model for this uh, big artillery piece, and I thought I was going to see one of those in action, and only to see a, a ton of them as a coordinated artillery battery. Uh, that's got to be the most impressive video game artillery thing I've ever seen. Not that artillery is really very front and center in most games. To do it any sort of justice is is, is very difficult. This is probably the closest anyone's come. I would suggest artillery is still more important than most other forms of military unit and certainly most other forms of gun. So to, to see that a sort of devastating artillery barrage like that uh, is really impressive. Clearly teams of people having to be used to run these as well, which is, which is realistic as well. In terms of the gun itself, I think it's loosely based on the, the famous um, German Big Bertha railway gun, or very large artillery piece, which I did, which did come in a, a I think it was a 30.5 30 centimeter variant. This is, this is meant to be a 300 mil artillery piece. Big stuff like this, usually transported and fired from rails because it's the only way to get something that's what, 42 tons, I think Big Bertha was. It's the only way to get these things around and into any kind of position where they can fire. But when they do fire, you're talking potentially ten, well, tens of miles of range from, from a big artillery piece. Now, well beyond what a normal game map can possibly handle. So all very impressive. The Steyr M95 infantry rifle. I am looking here at a sort of overhead pass on this beautifully modelled virtual M95. Very impressed with it. Ours is actually in better condition than the one in the game. I'm not going to say that's a criticism at all because it's amazing how quickly infantry weapons can can look old. Depending, it's more about the the service they've seen, where they've seen it in what sort of usage, and it's incredible how they can quickly look like military surplus in actual use. But it really does look good. Alright, 
We've got a sniper variant as well. I like the slight fisheye effect of the optics. I wonder if that's strictly accurate. All of the, all of the late 19th century optics I've looked through have been pretty pretty optically correct. Maybe, maybe the scope that they used for reference had that, that effect. Maybe they all do in this case, I don't know. But typically, by the late 19th century, you know, the Victorians knew optics. They could grind flat optics just as well, just with more time and cost, pretty much as we do today. So don't know if that distortion is actually fair, as it were. I did notice that the player is finger and thumbing the bolt, which is easily doable when the cocking piece is back, when it's gonna cock. It's a little awkward to do in the way depicted, but not impossible by any means when you've got the spring pressure to overcome. I would expect more of a grip like this. So using the meat of the hand, finger and thumb, but that support of the hand and much easier and more repeatable, especially when you've got cartridges in, in the weapon that are going to induce extra friction, extra drag. The most important thing for me, if I was advising on something like this, is find some manuals and try to try to replicate that. Because um, even if people deviated in actual combat, at least you've got a, a frame of reference and, and you can say to anyone that criticises, here's where we got the source. The super shotgun I have not played. It's gone very fantasy, I think it's fair to say. Well, more than sci-fi. It has um well almost a Gears of War vibe with the twin blades under the on the forend there. Much bulkier. It still has the, the extra raised rib on the top of the top of the breech, which is a feature of the original gun as well. Very convoluted design, we've got some very deeply etched, I guess it would be if it was real, decoration. Much more angular looking, the, the, the wood is sort of merged into the design in a way that the original isn't and a real sawn of shotgun wouldn't be. Uh, but we do, have, we do have sort of runes and symbols down the side, so I'm guessing this is a, in context, this is a, a legendary ancient weapon of some sort that we come across, like the original super shotgun or something. Okay, I'd, I'd forgotten the, the um, gameplay that I'd seen from this, from when it launched, that the blades under the barrel are not in fact some sort of Gears-esque bayonet, they are in fact your hook shot. So that's a very interesting way to make a, a gun that's been done to death something special and different. Yeah, I, mean, I can't comment on the use of grappling under barrel grapple, grapnel guns. <laughs> <laughs> they're not really a thing. Grapnel guns are, though. They have been made, and they've been made to work, but I don't think anyone's using them in the way that we see in the movies. And this is, they're certainly not using them to skewer things with and pull themselves into them in the way that we see here, but it, it's extremely cool. And it, it leverages the devastating double barrel effect of the super shotgun in a very creative way. All right, this is really cool. I, I like this quite a bit. Now, this is what we would call a, a combination weapon, but it, it actually is reminiscent of a, a real world sort of gun. I'll explain in a moment. So what it really is, is a, is a sledgehammer of whatever poundage, I'm not sure. It has the action of a sledgehammer, but when you do your ult, fire i imagine it's got a gun built into it so it's got a it's even got a magazine feeding up into the head of the sledgehammer and you can see this the firing pin or striker and the spring on the back of the head and then it'll have a muzzle on the front of the of the hammer and so it fires when you strike and then you've got a uh, quite a fun pump action to reload it now i can't begin to imagine how that pump action would ever really work i I suspect the answer is it wouldn't, but it's really cool. <laughs> and the real world relevance here is it's very similar in principle to a type of humane killer for, for slaughtering cattle or euthanizing, euthanizing cattle. It's a, a long wooden um, haft with a head on it. It's not really a hammer. It's not designed for that impact strike uh, because the idea is when it contacts the animal's head, 
it fires essentially a, a bolt gun. So it's a bolt gun on the end of a stick, but it works very much like this. I don't know if <laughs> the developers saw that type of killing tool, I suppose you call it, or if they came up with this completely independently, which I suspect is, is the truth. But um, fascinating for us here at the Royal Armouries because we deal with all sorts of weapons and armor. And this is a really interesting fictional weapon. Right, the SREM. This is the result of Rebellion coming back to us after our work on Sniper Elite 4 and asking, and at the time they were thinking DLC, what have you got that's really wacky but just about plausible? That's the, that's the secret, isn't it? With a, with a game like this, could there, could this thing have existed in that theatre at that time and be in his hands? And so I could not resist including this in my uh, short list of suggestions. And although the DLC didn't transpire, the SRAM is now in Sniper Elite 5. First ever appearance for this very unusual rifle. Now it says in the description text, it says developed for special ops by British SOE. This is actually not an SOE design. And it was designed by, I think these guys deserve some credit, although don't have a single name designer for this, unfortunately, but it was developed by the Czech section. And this is what they came up with. So it wasn't for special operations type work. It was a conceptual alternative to the self-loading rifle, if that makes any sense to you. And it probably doesn't because looking back, it's a bit quick. But this whole pump cocking arrangement where you press uh, the trigger that's not a trigger and you pull back the, the pump grip, the, the, the pistol grip, like it's a shotgun pump, and it pulls the bolt down a ramp. I'll explain that in a moment. And then you push forward to chamber around. That was all about trying not to disturb your, your position and hold as a sniper, as an alternative to semi-automatic fire. Now to us today, that sounds a bit bonkers, but at the time, not, you know, not everyone was sure that something like an M1 Garand was the way to go. They commissioned in 1944, um, 20 prototypes, only two were ever made. We've got this one. I'm guessing Carl has left the other one in Northern France somewhere. So ours is not complete. It's missing the front scope ring for reasons unknown. Uh, we've got some difference here. Um, the rifle seems to have the very fore end of a number four. So it's not a perfect replica of our only surviving SREM, they have taken the liberty of making the front end basically that of the number four. Bigger sight protectors, uh, wooden, wooden forend all the way to that point there, and then the barrel sort of floated within the woodwork like a number four. Uh, that must be a deliberate, deliberate design choice. Maybe in this universe, they have taken this concept a little bit further. Well, they must have done because it's out in the field, and they've gone with, with that to protect the, the barrel. I, I'm not sure. Whatever the details, uh, it's really nice to see this gun in the game and go, I helped that. <laughs> Whoa, this thing is a bit left field. There are those conventional rounds again, which I'm not a fan of in far, far future sci-fi, I'm sorry. Belted, linked rounds, this is a belt-fed gun. I'm not seeing how those rounds get diverted into what is apparently an upper and a lower barrel. The barrels have very chunky heat shields on them that bring to mind a number of designs. I suppose the, the Browning M2 is the the one that's going to link, uh, leap to mind, especially as I this is called heavy. I've got no sense of scale, but I think given the rounds, they're probably going to be 50 cal or equivalent. In fact, they look a lot like 50 BMG. Although from a profile view, you can only see the one belt and I'm thinking, oh, they fudged it. They're just diverting rounds up and some down. No, this is actually reminiscent of a couple of our 
anti-aircraft mounts that we have in the collection here at the Royal Armouries, where you have, well, the one I'm thinking of is four guns, and you have shoots, feed shoots, running from belt boxes, side by side, at different heights, into the different guns. Basically, exactly like this, because this is two guns that happen to be screwed together by, <laughs> by the look of it, operated off one trigger, of course. They're offset, they're displaced fore and aft, but that makes sense because the feed region of the gun has to align with the belt. So to actually offset the top one to the rear does actually make some sense. So what looks looked like a pretty wacky, silly design, actually, for somebody who has a tremendous amount of strength, is starting to make some sense, which is funny. So our, our twin fire modes here are pretty intriguing, actually. It's akin to deploying a bipod in a more realistic FPS. So we're getting a, a reduced dispersion when we flip out the handle and brace the thing more deliberately, um, which, which is logical. I have noticed a, a, something that detracts somewhat from the realism, as if we care about the realism, but uh, the cocking handle on the top, yeah, okay, that's, that's accessible um, for the gun on the top. How are we cocking the gun on the bottom? I imagine it's a case of there's a, the cocking handle would go straight through the bolt of the top gun and be physically attached to the bolt of the bottom gun in a different location and sheer brute strength means you can cock them both from one charging handle. That's what I'm going with. Strong want to kill something. So many. Wow, interesting design. Very fallout appropriate. There's very little I can't see anything that is an existing firearm part. This looks like something that's been invented from scratch, which is nice. This isn't Star Wars, so stuff that you know, stuff that's meant to have existed in the timeline that isn't from our universe shouldn't really incorporate recognizable firearm assemblies. But I like this. It's got a it's got a sort of ray gun aesthetic, but also there's a heat shield in there. There's a conventional iron sight and a gas piston arrangement. I like the look of this. Let's see how it plays. Okay, so the gameplay lives up to the name. This says it's a gyrojet system, this being the original gyrojet, or the pistol anyway. There is a, a carbine version with a, it's basically the same thing with a long barrel and a buttstock assembly on it. So this is a 1960s concept for a very sort of cheap, lightweight rocket gun. <laughs> so very simple design with a forward hammer that drops to the rear, strikes the the round on the nose to initiate the rocket motor inside and then the rocket ex accelerates back over the hammer to recock it and out the barrel. So this, this is like a concept for what would happen if this hadn't been an abject failure and had been developed into not only a successful pistol, but presumably a rifle and what they're calling here a heavy machine gun. Now looking at the caliber of the ammunition they're depicting here, that seems fair. That is at least a 50 caliber diameter projectile. The rounds are not conventional cased rounds as they shouldn't be. They should be their own self-contained propellant with vents in the back. The only thing that's not really clear from this is how it feeds from the magazine because that little mini rocket thing is thoroughly embedded in that mag and I can't see how it would line up with the feedway to then be initiated by the striker or the hammer depending what's inside. Right, so it isn't just a cosmetic skin for the ammunition. These are actually modeled as miniature rockets with fold-out fins, such as we do see on larger rockets. The gyrojet ammo didn't have folding fins. It relied on rotational stability from the vents at the back. This looks like uh, so some of the um, single-use rocket, or well, um, guided missile systems have that style of folding fin that fold out to give you that stability. And we can actually see the rocket exhaust on this thing as well. And as they travel through the air, we see a smoke trail, which we would see and do see. If you watch footage of a gyrojet being shot, you'll see the little tiny rockets trailing a trail. <laughs> this 
This is the, the Milcor M32 grenade launcher, 40 millimeter grenade launcher. It's not, I suppose, super widely encountered, but there are quite a few out there. As a grenade launcher, it does fire in quite quite the arc. But that's a that's positive advantage when you're trying to lob in explosives. You, you don't necessarily want to fire straight and level anyway. Um, this looks to be very well modeled indeed, including what looks to be all the functionality that you would expect. In other words, being able to open it up um, rotate the drum to different position even, selectively load different types of ammunition into your drum. Having having never fired one, but having seen some footage, the it looks it looks to be realistically modeled. The grenade launchers in games vary pretty wildly in how closely they model the actual arc of a 40 millimeter grenade. This looks to be right. The size of the explosion looks to be right. Yeah, I, I, I would expect no less, to be honest. <laughs> I suppose that isn't wildly different from the hilarious noob tube of Call of Duty close range use of grenade launcher thing where correctly uh, the, the round doesn't arm at that short distance, uh, it arms through you know, rotation. Uh, it's a safety thing, you don't want the thing going off near you. The question is, I think I've seen somebody try to replicate this with like a gelatin torso or something is what what would be the damage to the human body at that close range from this low velocity but relatively heavy projectile i'm not going to say whether this is right or wrong except to say that i think if it impacted in the backpack like that it might not just go down dead immediately I, i'm all right i'm speculating too much it is essentially a blunt trauma weapon uh, inside the arming distance We have quite an amusing dropping of four grenade rounds there and the way they sort of gently roll off into the distance for some reason has, has tickled me quite a bit. I assume you can pick them back up again? You definitely want to dust them off if you do that. Uh, now, in reality, there'd be a, a small risk there of damaging something by dropping them that would negatively affect their performance. Not advisable to reuse dropped rounds of any kind, really unless you're really in a pinch. Or, in this case, you don't want to waste some quite expensive ammunition. It's a really interesting gameplay there with impacts on a hard surface from the grenade and the person nearby is taken out. More so than I think would be the case in your typical shooter. That, that seems to work on a blast radius thing. This appears to be modeling fragmentation. If you're within like a meter or two meters of, of that exploit, of the edge of that, the visible edge of that little fireball, effectively, you've still got some sharp bits of metal cutting through you and that's modeled. So you can take, you can clearly take advantage of that in the game by deliberately aiming at a hard surface to get that um, explosion, that fragmentation and take somebody out. Selected mode, stone cold killer. Happy slaughtering. I paused there. Wow. I don't know what to say about that. I kind of like it. <laughs> it it seems like something you'd get in a Fifth Element sequel. C yeah, cr crossed with um, something like uh, Mr. D DNA from Jurassic Park, which is based on old, you know, 40s, 50s training films and public information films with animated characters in them, of course. It's a talking bullet that wears shades. Uh, apart from Skippy himself, <laughs> the gun looks kind of understandably normal. It, it's sort of a, a low-profile self-loading pistol. I assume it uses conventional-ish ammunition, but it's got some kind of smart targeting capability that I imagine I'm about to see the results of. Error. Premature discharge. I'm sorry. This never happens. <laughs> Pause. Right, I should learn to uh, watch the whole thing before commenting because this is not at all conventional. Doesn't have a slide, doesn't have a bolt, doesn't seem to eject any cartridge cases, so I'm guessing it's caseless and has some tiny microscopic internal bolt. It also produces its own negligent discharges <laughs> as, as a sort of meta plot point, which is I think is genius. Okay, I've just noticed that there's something reciprocating at the front of the gun. I'm, I'm trying to remain professional and focused here, despite the uh, amusement <laughs> factor. So there is, there's something cycling here. There's something chambering, locking, firing, uh, God knows how. And a load of other AI electronic gubbins. A possibly final footnote on this one is that we appear to have t uh, ambidextrous slide release controls on this. Only there isn't a slide. 
and they don't appear to do anything. I think they were probably modelled as pinch-to-release catches for the magazine, which is quite reminiscent of the P90 in the way that it comes in from the rear and is horizontal, and presumably, f well, this feeds from the front rather than the P90 mag, which feeds from the rear, but probably the inspiration for this. But yeah, those controls don't seem to do anything. The magazine secures itself and is just pulled off the gun when it's empty. But far be it from me to criticise Skippy. Right, I think I understand the autonomous aiming thing now. So the gun isn't aiming at all, it's the projectiles that are being guided. So like, like at least one of the other guns in the game, you fire them conventionally, or the gun fires itself in this case, when the mood takes it, and then the projectiles are guided to the part to the target, or in this case, the part of the target specifically that the AI is able to target. Really fascinating concept, even if it was done, done seriously, but instead we have the sort of Borderlands level humour, uh, which I, <laughs> I cannot help laughing at. The, the fun facts especially are, uh, are really, <laughs> well, fun. <laughs> Thanks again for watching. If you enjoy this kind of content, please make sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel as we'll have new episodes of Firearms Expert Reacts every Saturday and new episodes of Loadout every Sunday. Again, please check out the links in the description of the video if you want to help support the Royal Armouries and we'll catch you next time.